Should we get started? You guys ready? Yep. Yes. Are you ready, Dr. Gary? I am ready. Okay. Uh, thank you guys all for coming. Um, I love this school. I love these kids. I love this author. I love his books. Um, and I think here's I think here's where I want to start. Uh, last night. <laughs> Um, I think um, last night you talked about uh, the, the companion standalone piece that you wrote after Wednesday Wars, which obviously is okay for now, uh, with Doug Swiatek, and this, uh, this book has the Shakespeare place, but the next book has the Audubon Birds of America. And you talked about finding um, birds that uh, would, would reflect Doug's life. So you essentially had your plot first and you found birds to match. And the first thing I want to know is how did that work with the Shakespeare plays? Did the plot come first or did you string the Shakespeare plays together? How did that work? Um, I think you're giving me too much credit for planning. Okay. <laughs> because um, I wish it had been like that, that you could sort of say, here are the 10 chapters and here are the 10 birds and then you move you know, on and on and on right through it. Um, and that was, in both cases, that really wasn't true. Okay. So it was much more organic trial and error. So the first, and the uh, okay for now, I had to look for a bird that I wanted to show was by itself and in trouble. And so the first bird was actually an owl in, um, in okay for now. And it's on a dead tree with a dead branch, which is a beautiful picture. But I needed to find 10 narrative pictures in um, a single volume, and there's four volumes. And I couldn't find more narrative pictures in that volume or enough. And so that whole first chapter has been, is gone. I don't, I don't think it exists anymore. Uh, and it was all, all had to be rewritten until I could find something else. And so the one that really struck me then was the bird that seems to be falling into the ocean, the Arctic Tern. And it's not, but Doug sees him as falling into the ocean. And then after that, it was more, okay, what happens to Doug next? What's another narrative picture? Can I make this one fit? Oh, no, five pages into it. No, no, this thing's go back, try another one. It was much more trial and error. It's a lot of trial and It was error. a lot, but you know, you, you just keep throwing pages away. I was going to say, how much text do you think oh, you a lot. threw away? Yeah, you just keep throwing it away. I, I know that when I um, cut paragraphs out of my kids' writing, they want. They have a stroke, huh. and 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 we've thrown sure. chapters. Oh yeah, away. You, you yeah. Just, right. I mean, nothing is sacred in that. You can, you throw away a whole lot. And writing is a brain surgery. You don't have to get it right the first time. You can mm -hmm. keep going back again and again and again. Yeah. And that was the same with Shakespeare too. Yeah. Um, you have to find what's going on. What's the next part of this adventure or journey, and what play matches. Right. So speaking of that. Uh, we're going to get to some Shakespeare. These are my first um, questions that we're going to set aside, but um, can we talk about Macbeth for a second? Sure. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Baker and Shakespeare both assert that we are made for more than power, uh, more than our desires. So I want to ask you what I asked my children. These are all Socratic seminar questions uh, that they've already answered. So if that's true, that we are made for more than power, more than our desires, what is that more that we are made for? It's the most un-American notion. And what the more is service. That's what we're made for. And that's our, our highest fulfillment is in service to someone else. And in America right now, we see ourselves as um, what will make us great, we think, is wealth or power. And that's not true. It's not even close to true. Uh, what really makes a country, a nation great, an individual great, a school great, is service. That's what does it. And probably why you have just won this Abbott um, amazing thing. I mean, that's, that all connects. It seems to me that we don't really value that as much as we really should value that. I, another word that comes to mind is sacrifice. And a lot Both of people of are not willing to sacrifice and serve. Right, right. Yeah. So in the story, um, in this chapter with uh, Holling, um, we have a couple of characters that emerge trying to be powerful, mm -hmm. like Mr. Hood Hood, 
uh, Mr. Qureshi, who is going to be the dictator of a small country, right? <laughs> yes. And so I, can you comment a little bit, um, uh, because I think it's so interesting how you have weaved these Shakespeare plays so intricately with these characters. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Well, it really is. I mean, um, a character who really, really wants to assert, who wants bucks, who wants power in the community, <laughs> is much like Macbeth, but Macbeth is past that. Obviously, he is uber that. Macbeth makes this class, and I don't want to say classic, but this huge mistake where he believes the people who have made this prophecy that he's going to be king. But the people who told him that are really awful people. I mean, they're witches. Right. They mean to deceive. They mean to destroy. And when he listens to them, he just takes it as a sort of fate, but he doesn't understand that he's making a choice or he doesn't want to believe that he's making a choice to do really awful thing, including send henchmen to kill children. I mean, he will do that, including one a woman who's pregnant. He will kill her, too. That's the choice that he's made based on the, what the witches have told him and what he wants to believe. Right. And so because he acts in that way, then you see the whole thing fall apart. And when we see someone in a community like Mr. Hood Hood who acts in the wrong way, who acts in a way out of just greed, then you see that, wow, this is all going to come badly. Yes, yes. Um, a lot of people, I think, I, I think there are a lot of people who walk around, they can be young people, they can be people of any age from any um, walk of life, feel like they have no choice. And so to leave something to fate is something that I think we're very susceptible to in this country and not taking responsibility or not. Um, having the ability to choose. This is a huge, one of the huge themes in, in Wednesday Wars. And so from Romeo and Juliet, uh, uh, I, think I, I think every single person in this room knows how you're gonna answer this question. I know, and I, I know you know what I'm about to ask you, but are we all subject to the stars, merely fortune's fools, or can we choose for ourselves I think we know what you would say, but what would you say to somebody who really does believe that we don't have a choice, or someone who doesn't feel as if they have a choice? What would you say to them? I think it's complicated. Um, it is, I mean, I think all of us here would want to assert that we make our own decisions. We come to the point where we can make our own decisions, and we then act upon those decisions. And as much as is in our power, we need to do that. I mean, that's what being a grown-up is, um, when you actually say, this is what I believe, this is what I actually adhere to, and I believe it not because my parents believe it or my friends believe it, but because I believe it, and then I act out of that. And in Romeo and Juliet, you see a character who fails to do that, but who in some ways is instinctively good, but is blown in. But having just said that, um, we also know that it is the case that there are people who are trapped in circumstances. We all know those people who are trapped in economic circumstances, who are trapped, are trapped in I know, social circumstances, maybe even political in some ways. And those people don't necessarily have the kinds of independent um, action that's possible. And that goes back then again to service. Yeah. How then do you respond as someone who may have more than that other person? What's your next step once you recognize who that person is? And how do you act? Um, that seems to me to be a really, really important question in America. Yeah. I think we're also susceptible in this country and in all over the world. I think this is a human condition where we tend to allow other people to do our thinking for us. And maybe that's where we give up um, our, our ability to choose. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I, think that's, I think that's very connected. So um, from Julius Caesar, <laughs> We're just going to hop right along here through these uh, Shakespeare plays. From Julius Caesar, um, where do we find the power of goodness and honesty and faithfulness when it seems that the whole world is conspiring against us? Yeah, this is, um, I love this play because it's so surprisingly complex. Um, Brutus is the main character there. I mean, it's Julius Caesar, but Brutus is the main character, who is also the one who's going to be brought into the assassination attempt. Though he doesn't want to at the beginning. He's his, his own his, Caesar's friend. And yet he's dra dragged into it. The reason that Brutus is dragged into it 
is that he's actually a really good person. He's really a good guy. And he sees Caesar as taking over the country, um, as being dominant and as removing all the democracy that had been still, right? And so he decides in the end that he is going to have to act against Caesar, assassinate Caesar, be part of that plot, because he doesn't want Caesar to bring Rome down. So in a sense, he actually believes, a good guy, he actually believes that he should do a good, that this is a good thing. But it's an assassination. Right. You're taking a dagger and you're plunging it into your friend's back. With a bunch of people. With a bunch of other people. Yeah. In the end, it's an evil act. Right. And so the play asks really a hard question. Should you do something that is clearly wrong in order to bring a greater justice to bear? And Shakespeare's answer to that is, no, obviously not. But Brutus doesn't learn that until it's too late. Right, so the ends do not justify the means. Shakespeare would say no. Shakespeare. Right, I mean, he would say, this look what happens, because in fact, it doesn't even work. He brings down right. Caesar, there's a civil war, and then Augustus comes in, and he will be a much more powerful emperor than Caesar ever would have been, and democracy is over for the next 450 years. Um, it really, it completely backfires. Right. He does it out of good motives, but it's completely misguided. Good intentions. Good intentions. Poor judgment. Very poor judgment. Very poor judgment. So where do you, so where do we find that power of goodness, that power of honesty, that power of faithfulness, when in these in these times? Metaphor. Um, <laughs> um, you find them in small individual acts, which have to accrue into larger acts. It doesn't seem right now, red state guys, sorry, it doesn't seem right now that our Congress or our President are able to, do, to show any leadership in that direction. I don't think you have to be left or right to say it. I mean, just look at it, be, be honest. We don't seem to be, as a country, able to do good things. Um, it should be the case that the United States Army, we talked about this the other day, that the United States Army should arrive anywhere in the world and everyone should go, oh, thank goodness, they're finally here. But everyone's afraid of us. Now why? Something has gone terribly awry. And it doesn't matter whether you're on the left or right, you have to say something is wrong when we, this most powerful country, are, are people are afraid of us. That shouldn't be, that shouldn't be. Yeah, I think that middle school is a microcosm of the world. We have everybody here, everybody goes to school. Everybody from Hitler to Mother Teresa has gone to school. Um, if they had that privilege in their society, some, there are many places where if you're female, you can't attend school or, you know, there are... Or there poor. Are, or poor. Um, but um, in, I, I would say in a middle school setting, we bring it. And in a community, we bring it. We bring the power of goodness, of honesty, of faithfulness, if we choose. Sure. And it goes back to, can we choose? Can we choose? So, that's wonderful. I think um, we're going to jump into Hamlet. You know, I don't... Who, who jumps into Hamlet? Who jumps into that? Um, we, I don't... I tell my kids, you're not allowed to read with them. It's not for a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old kid, you know? Well, every time you say that, someone goes home and reads Macbeth. I, and that's what happened. But then I thought, really, Hamlet, not Hamlet either. <laughs> because that's just your... When did someone ever tell you, don't read this book, and you said, okay, I won't read it. Did you ever do that in your life? Um, no, is the answer. I'll give you the answer. No. I would have to, okay, I'd have to confess that. <laughs> I was once told, don't read The Exorcist, from the pulpit. Oh. As I said, do not read The Exorcist, it will be bad for you. Mm -hmm. And that was Sunday, Monday morning, I went to McLean's drugstore on the way home from high school and bought it. Yeah. I was surprised at some of the words I saw there, I'd never seen them in print before. It was interesting. I think I'm okay. I really just like to think that my kids just do everything I say. Wow, that's <laughs> um, So from Hamlet, and... Um, we, this from The Tempest, I think, from The Tempest and from Hamlet both, um, because you have Ariel, who ends up being more human uh, than, um, who's, who's the protagonist? Prospero. Prospero, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, Ariel is schooling Prospero on how to be human, 
basically, in, a, in one scene. And then in Hamlet, um, I think there's an exchange between Mrs. Baker and, and Holling about what it means to be human. Yeah. So that is my question. What does it mean to be human? Well, you know, I was in London last, a year ago, January, yeah. and we went to see The Tempest. It was my favorite play. It was, I can't even describe to you how riveting it was. It was amazing, amazing set, everything was amazing. But Ariel was extraordinary. And what they'd done was to, there was a, a screen, a round screen, like a tube that was lowered. And Ariel wore the same technology that's used in Lord of the Rings, the sort of motion capture. It was actually the same guy who did that, who did the technology. And so when Ariel moved, you saw him also moving in this really ethereal way. And this is a stage play. Stage play. So Ariel comes down in one scene, and Prospero is looking at his daughter, who is falling in love with Ferdinand, who's falling in love with Miranda. So they're both falling in love with each other. And Ariel looks at, um, watches Prospero, who is this guy who owns him, he's his right. owner. Um, he's looking at him, at, at Prospero, watching his daughter and future son-in-law. And he sees Prospero sort of jealous. This is a weird thing for him. But Ariel turns to, the, to Prospero and says this killer line. He goes, do you love me, master? I mean, trying to make the, the most important human connection, do you love me? And Prospero, without even looking at him, says, no. And you see the whole audience just almost slide down in your chair and die. No, I don't. He just says it, I don't. And you watch Ariel, and the whole beginning of the play, he is literally on his toes. His, his, this actor is amazing. His heels never touch the stage. After that moment, he is slow. And when Ariel is finally freed, in every other projection I've ever seen, he runs away. I mean, he's free, like the genie at the end of Aladdin. You know, and he just takes off. He's gone, because he's free, finally. But in this one, he really slowly leaves the stage, looking backward. Having not been free, but dismissed. I don't care. Go away. Done. That's such a, a specific nuance. Oh my goodness! It just killed us. I mean, I looked at this guy. I've never. I haven't forgotten that. I mean, someone who's told, "I don't love you. Go away. I'm done with you." you no, know, and that's the opposite of what it means to be a human being. Um, it's, it's exactly the opposite, in fact, because a human being is always affirming the humanness, the humanity of another being, right. always. And to do the opposite, which is what Prosper was doing, is just really, just so destructive. And how many times do we see people absolutely doing that, becoming not a human being because we deny other people their humanity? Their humanity. A shooter at Parkland School is doing exactly that. Yes. A congressman voting against DACA is doing exactly that. I mean, and again and again and again. Yeah. Or even someone who wants to sit at a lunch table and is told no. It's, it's, uh, it's very human to recognize the human, humanity in other people. I think that is such a great answer. I love that. I love that. I thought your favorite Shakespeare play was Much Ado About Nothing. Oh, I do love that play because um, it's so funny. But I, my favorite is really The Tempest. And it, I mean, maybe it has something to do with seasons of life. Mm -hmm. um, Much Ado is a time of marriage, mm -hmm. early days. Um, the Tempest is sort of an older person's, yeah, this, this, he's got it exactly right. I mean, Shakespeare is saying farewell. He's speaking directly to the audience saying, goodbye, I'm done. Yeah. And it's really a terribly sad ending, though exactly the right ending. Prospero is going to go off, he'll be fine, he'll spend his last days on the island. But he's sort of done. I'll throw my books away, he says. Well, that's exactly what Shakespeare's doing at that point. Right. I'm sort of done with this part of my life, and I'll live out just the rest, but I'm sort of done. Yeah. Um, I like the, the poignancy of that. Sure. Um, so I have uh, one more Shakespeare question, um, and that is from Much Ado About Nothing. And uh, it's a, it comes from a conversation between Holling and the Staker, you know, because that's what they do on Wednesdays. <laughs> um, and uh, it says, um, uh, if we truly can choose for ourselves, what will it take for us as a society to choose peace and wisdom over war and folly? Well, um, <laughs> graciousness, grace, 
kindness. Um, I mean, we just we we don't even believe that those can exist now. We don't we don't think they're powerful. We don't think an act of kindness is as powerful as an act of violence. We don't think a, an impulse towards peace is anything but naive. Um, I have no idea how we got there. I mean, how can we really believe now? How can we really believe that violence and aggression are in fact what we what is more powerful than um, an act of peace, especially in America? I mean, where we have had a history, at least every so often, of doing exactly the right thing at exactly the right moment. I mean, we enter World War I for good reasons. We enter World War II for good reasons. We even go to Korea, at least in part, for good reasons. Even Vietnam for good reasons. The those turn sour. No, I don't know. I, really, we seem to have lost the notion that we should be, that we're the good guys. That we should be acting in that way. And now we just say, let's earn as much as we can. Let's get as much as we can. I, I think there is so much of that, um, the profit over people. But you know what else I, I see? And I see this in so many situations, so many, um, I, I do see it on the news, where um, when there's a hurricane, people will sure. sacrifice and people will, um, will rescue animals and children and and people and and we see these glimmers of hope and I when I write, I write a lot about hope I'm the hope girl I love hope and um, I see a lot of hope givers right here at Sage Valley I do think that these kids are some of the kindest most respectful people you um, maybe 200 times you know how are you? I'm, I'm well, how are you? I, you know, just being polite and, and all of that. And I think middle school, and you probably agree, is the time when people are, young people are identifying who they are. Would you say that that's true, you guys? No. Would you say that this is, no, you're saying no? no. What are you saying? No. Yes, I think that's true. <laughs> yeah. I think the room is split on this. I think that, um, there is, um, there is such, um, this is such a vulnerable time, and it's such a fertile time for um, figuring out who you are. And this brings me to the last question, because you have said, I write one story, I write those moments when a child begins to turn his or her face toward adulthood. So my last question, before we send these little biscuits off to their seventh period class, uh, the last question before we go to the library, right, is what are those moments? How would you define those moments when a child first begins to turn her or his head toward adulthood? He's never going to do an interview with me ever again. I think, um, it isn't necessarily an act, it's more of a mindset. So that when do you get to the point when you can say out here, um, you before me? I mean, when do you get to that, to that mindset? And I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, your school is, I go to a lot of schools, 50, 60 a year. Your school is amazing. Um, it's amazing not only because of the physical facilities, but because you have teachers who love you and care about you and who are smart. You have administrators, your principal is incredibly forward-looking and smart and wants so much, yearns so much for you to be well, well educated and a great experience. I have to tell you guys, that's not always the case. What you guys have here, which you may take as a normal, just completely normal, is not. And there are schools I've been to where this auditorium, oh my goodness, it's not even close. Um, the fact that you could all sit here and listen to something like this never happened. Um, a library, in some schools I've been to, are you nuts? We don't have a library. 40% of American public schools, guys, 40% have no librarian. 40%. The notion of buying books for your library, are you kidding? Who would do that? I mean, over and over, I could take you to a school where there are whole halls which are locked off because the rooms have been destroyed and there's no money. A, lot, a school in Clinton, Tennessee, where when I look up at the ceiling, 
all the tiles are falling out. And when I say, what's going on with that? They go, well, we can't fix it because it's you know, filled with asbestos and we'd have to clean it all up. And so you'd be sitting here as asbestos, a poison, dribbles down on you. I've been to those schools. I've been to a school that has no library and the dictionaries for their kids were the dictionaries I had in first grade. I'm not making that up. First grade, this is a million years ago. I mean, it's really quite amazing. And so here's the challenge. What are you gonna do about it? You guys, one day, not very long from now, will be 18, you'll be voting, you'll be taxpayers, you'll be doing stuff within your community. How will you do what my generation has failed to do? How will you be able to take schools and change them so that everyone has an education and an experience like you have here, um, which you take as the norm? How will you make it the norm? Because we haven't been able to do it. We've failed. But don't you fail. You should be the next generation that succeeds. And that's when you become an adult. I think that's fantastic. Can we give Dr. Gary a hand? But um, come to come to the Nampa Public Library at four o'clock until five thirty. That's about all the time we have. And we what? Uh, they can go back to sixth period. Okay, you guys, there are ten minutes left of sixth period. Go ahead and. Yeah. Yeah.